This afternoon, President Kennedy strode from his White House office to put into words the feelings of millions of Americans about a 40-year-old test pilot. Hey, hey. We have a long way to go in the space race. Uh, we started late, but this is the new ocean, and I believe the United States uh, must sail on it and be in a position uh, second to none. Some years, months ago, I said that I hoped that every American would uh, serve his country. Today, uh, Colonel Glenn uh, served his, and we all express our thanks to him. Yeah. This is an NBC special news report. Brought to you by the Gulf Oil Corporation. This program is sponsored by Gulf in the belief that the American people want to know the important events of our day. What makes them important and why? And that such knowledge can come only from an objective presentation of facts. The vital thing Gulf believes is that we all need to understand the world in which we live. Tonight, American in Orbit, the story of the triumph of John Herschel Glenn, Jr. And here is NBC News correspondent Frank McGee. A great sigh rose across the land this afternoon as millions of Americans experienced the end of an intensely moving experience. The emotions felt privately by each of us, but at the same time shared in common with a good part of humanity, were compounded, I think, of prayerful thanksgiving and enormous relief. Only after these, I believe, did we permit ourselves to feel a justifiable touch of pride. We had, after all, anticipated so long this country's first effort to place a man in orbit. We had encountered so many maddening delays. We had feared each of us for the safety of the chosen astronaut, John Glenn. This despite the knowledgeable assurances of the officials most intimately connected with the project and of Colonel Glenn himself. We had, on a memorable day in January, moved to within 20 minutes of launching time, only to see the vast effort defeated again by weather. And finally, we reached today, February 20th. And we had by this time, it seems to me, reached something bordering on hypnosis, irresistibly drawn to the event, and at the same time, repelled by our fears of what might happen. We think, so I think some of us tried to spare ourselves from living those crucial moments by tending to believe, even when the launching was only a few minutes away, that something would happen and the flight would again be postponed. But then, inexorably, it seemed, the elaborate ritual continued and the clock gnawed away at the remaining moments of delusion that we had permitted ourselves. The launch occurred. It was both frightening and beautiful. And then for almost five hours, few people in the civilized world allowed their thoughts to stray very far from the American in space. It was at the end of those five hours when word was flashed that Colonel Glenn had landed safely at the end of three orbits and had been brought hale and hearty aboard a ship in the Atlantic, then that the great sigh arose. With the comforting knowledge that all ended well, we will now relive some of those moments, beginning in reverse order and seeing what happened not first, but last. Our great good luck that we had hoped would prevail and allow us to bring you motion pictures of the recovery of Colonel Glenn at sea did not hold, and we do not have those motion pictures. However, we do have some still pictures made of Colonel Glenn shortly after he came aboard the USS Noah, the destroyer that re affected his recovery. And the first picture you see is Colonel Glenn in the wardroom of the Noah, being stripped of his spacesuit. You can see that the sensors are still attached to his body, and this was the very beginning of the immediate medical debriefing. And then a few moments later, Colonel Glenn was lying on the couch and uh, the photographers caught him with an enormous smile on his face as he began to actually undergo the first of several intensive physical examinations that he will be given in the next 48 hours. And a few moments later, another picture was made of Colonel Glenn on the telephone. He was still lying on the table and the doctors were making the physical examination. And it is our understanding that this picture was made while Colonel Glenn was in voice communication with President Kennedy, who had called from the White House in Washington. And then at 
Eastern Standard Time this evening. Colonel Glenn completed the routine aboard the um, carrier Randolph and left by jet plane for Grand Turk Island where he will undergo the intensive uh, and extensive debriefings tonight and tomorrow. Debriefing is a term that means that doctors and technicians will attempt to get him to recall all of his reactions during the flight. These will include both the physical and the emotional or psychological reactions. To those of us who have never had an adventure as monumental as the one Glenn experienced today, it's hard to imagine what he has, in fact, gone through. But now let's begin to take a closer look at Glenn's entire day. And that report is coming up. And in the last few moments, we have received transmission of still two more still photographs of the recovery of Colonel Glenn and the bringing aboard of the astronaut uh, on the uh, USS destroyer NOAA. So let's take a look at those now. I'm sure you would want to see them. May we have the picture of Colonel Glenn as he's coming aboard the destroyer? There he is now in his spacesuit. He is out of the capsule, as you can see. This was made aboard the USS NOAA. And I believe we have still one more picture, do we not? Fine. And this is the capsule itself being lifted from the water by a crane aboard the destroyer. At this point, Colonel Glenn was still inside the capsule. In fact, about 25 minutes later, they blasted the escape hatch away so that he could uh, step out onto the deck of the ship. Of course, Colonel Glenn has been training for today's orbital flight for nearly three years. It was that long training period which made the interminable delays in Mercury Atlas VI, the delays going all the way back to last December, made those delays bearable and livable. John Glenn was awakened this morning by the astronaut's doctor and was told again that this, this might be the day. It was 2.20 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and the Atlas booster stood silently on its pad while Lieutenant Colonel Powers briefed newsmen on each detail of his awakening. This was the scene at that time. 2.20 this morning, Eastern Standard Time at Cape Canaveral. Colonel Powers briefing reporters on the situation. a little shave and shower. He had breakfast at 2.45. And a little change in routine this morning. We had a quiet breakfast with just John, Dr. Douglas, Deke Slayton. I was a little bit late, but I had breakfast too. Breakfast had uh, scrambled eggs, the standard filet, little fruit juice, toast, jelly, and some postum. Postum. Orange juice. Orange juice. This is Florida, you know. But soon it would be outer space, and so John Glenn must be suited up. The frail body of man cannot, after all, survive without elaborate protection. His silvery spacesuit is another backup protection against the hostile elements. Colonel Glenn appeared at ease and unconcerned about the dangers he must have known that he faced. Finally, he left his quarters in Hangar S. Inside the hangar, and there comes Colonel John Glenn, the astronaut walking along carrying his portable air conditioning unit. It seems to be a new type of unit this time. Walking beside him as the doctor, Bill Douglas, and up the four steps now and into the transfer van. His helmet is on this morning. He's not carrying it in his hand. Uh, a couple of the doctors and technicians boarding the van with him. Dr. Howard Minners, as well as uh, Dr. Douglas, his personal physician. The man beginning to move around the transfer van now, getting the door shut. Beginning to get ready to unplug the ground power supply. This van carries its own motor for producing its electricity in, in uh, motion. The astronaut goes inside, moves to the back of the transfer van. He'll take his seat there in a sort of reclining chair. All of his instruments will be plugged into the devices which monitor his heart rate, blood pressure, breathing rate while he's going out to the pad. One of the truck technicians now pulling the ground power plug off the side of the truck, and the truck will begin to move out very soon. That was Richard Bate describing the scene as Colonel Glenn entered the transportation van and was moved to pad 14. 
Herb Kaplow continues the description as the van nears the service tower and Colonel Glenn prepares to dismount and climb the elevator to his capsule. Friendship 7. And here is pilot Glenn stepping out now, switching the portable air cooler from his left to his right hand then back to his left and he moves his way around the front of the truck on launch pad 14 moving along some of the superstructure of the tower and smiling and waving his hand for a moment to some of the workmen there and shaking hands for a moment and now stepping into the elevator followed by Dr. Douglas by Sioux technician Schmidt by astronaut Kadeek Slayton and the Elevator is still poised at the first level. The door is closed and the elevator now it starts to ascend to the 11th deck. Inside the 11th deck white room, astronaut Glenn steps in and is patted on the arm by a couple of the workmen on the 11th deck who are dressed in their white smocks and white caps. The astronaut shakes hands with another member of the white room crew, stands off to the side, and if he follows custom and simulations, probably is asking the pad leader, where does the pad crew stand in the count? In short, is the spacecraft ready to receive him? He's looking at some papers now and hands one to the pad leader. He's talking and looking again at some documents in front of him. They appear to be index cards of sorts. This white room is designed to be as free of dust as possible to keep the spacecraft from gathering any dust or any rust. The astronaut now adjusts the small package over his chest, which is a mirror, and beneath that, a life raft, a small uh, life preserver beneath that. The mirror is there so that cameras behind his head in the spacecraft can shoot from their angle and by the reflection of the mirror discern the expressions on the astronaut's face. John Glenn standing there and there is a trace of a smile now as he listens and bends his head for a moment. Some strong light off to the side, shining into the room, and that is the pad leader, Gunther Wendt, who was a flight engineer in the German Luftwaffe during the war, is now the top man, the boss in charge of the white room where the activity is now concentrated. This is John Glenn's second trip for the real thing to the White Room, and it doesn't seem to have shaken him from his facial expressions, frequently smiling as he chats with other members of the crew. Joe Schmidt, the suit technician, with earphones over his white pilot-type cap, he by now has probably laid out the restraining straps in the spacecraft so that Glenn doesn't lie on them when he moves in. A NASA inspector, and now Glenn walks up the few steps and is removing the dust galoshes, the smiling, as he chats with other members of the crew. Joe Schmidt, the suit technician, with earphones over his white pilot type cap. He by now has probably laid out the restraining straps in the spacecraft so that Glenn doesn't lie on them when he moves in. 
a NASA inspector, and now Glenn walks up the few steps and is removing the dust galoshes, the overshoes, which are to protect his shoes and keep them as free of dirt as possible. And momentarily, they're off now and puts his right then left foot in and moves in first part of his body through the hatch, holding on with both hands for a moment or so, then with one hand on a hold bar above the relatively small hatchway, making his way very carefully into the capsule, into the spacecraft, and is being helped by the suit technician, Joe Schmidt, and by a NASA technician, the NASA inspector. And thus was the stage set for the first orbital flight by an American. He maneuvered himself into the capsule at 6.30 a.m. But because of a bulky bolt on the hatch door and some less minor delays for weather, it was to be more than three hours before he would be launched into space. We go back now to 9.46 a.m. Eastern Standard Time this morning, one minute before the actual liftoff. We will offer no supplemental commentary. None is needed. And the only voice you will hear will be that of Colonel John Powers reporting from the nerve center, Mercury Control, for the liftoff. T minus 10 seconds and counting. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition, liftoff. The MA-6 vehicle has lifted off. The MA-6 vehicle has lifted off. Trajectory looks good. The MA-6 vehicle is off the launch pad at 47 minutes after the hour. It is climbing nicely. All systems are reported go. Range safety reports it is all green. The MA-6 vehicle is climbing cleanly. The trajectory is still A-OK. -okay. The MA-6 vehicle is still climbing nicely. vehicle is climbing nicely, has passed through the area of maximum dynamic pressures. Pilot John Glenn is reporting all systems go, is giving routine reports, reading off his instruments. John Glenn reports the flight very smooth now. The MA-6 launch vehicle proceeding on its pre-planned trajectory. John Glenn reports his cabin pressure now holding at 6.1 pounds per square inch. The MA-6 vehicle is still climbing on its trajectory. John Glenn reports the G-Force is building now to uh, six. Booster engine cutoff has been confirmed by the pilot. And so those critical and exceedingly dangerous early moments of the flight were behind him. Colonel Glenn's capsule, named the Friendship 7, was a few moments later inserted into orbit. And at this point, it was the words of Glenn himself which told the story best. And that report is coming.